the 31st of August. A little early, so. It is the 31st of August, it's about uh, 14 hours and 30 minutes into the day, into the day at about 2.30 in the afternoon, and we're cruising towards the stop sign. How do you talk to the kids about morality? If they're amoral, they don't have any sense of morality. 
And ironically enough, they were the, the, well, the parents weren't around to, 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 to do or say anything for most people. Because, you know, you know, the feminists had to have their thing in there. And, you know, women were just as important as men. And so they went out and had their career like just like the men did. And, well, uh, they left the children to the venerable teachers, to the to the government, to be taught by the government as to what is right and what is wrong. Wow, we saw what the government has been doing. Right? You know, Epstein, Epstein was working for the government. He was supplying uh, the government with enough of those politicians the politicians. Uh, let's call them gymnastics. Uh, well, they apparently the politicians were rather athletic. And he just been a long time at the gym. So I understand here again, this is a bit of a term of the nosies. The top of the Greek. The gym in Greek means naked. So you would understand what you would do at the gymnasium. Considering it's meaning. This is actually this is what the Olympics were. The Olympics were it was that a gym a form of gymnastic sport. They were done completely naked. So the sense of propriety was was that was one of that anything goes. It was the form of The hedonism. It wasn't a religious. It had a firmly planted in no It was Gnostic in its origin. So therefore, it was uh, therefore it is not a, it is not a so-called religion without a Gnostic root. And even now, because it is not a law, and it is called ancient science, modern science. Modern science ended when modern the universe was ordered. The ones who didn't believe in God, these were the uh, Voltaire's group. Well, they were primarily philosophers. They weren't actually scientists. And their perspective was is that, well, you see, you see uh, mathematics uh, and science, that's the highest truth because you can determine things exactly. So they determined mathematically that it was not possible to have the atomic bomb. I mean, it was a nice theory and everything like that, the confusion and so on and so forth. So they could, I should say, fission. To do fission. So they said, oh, it was a nice theory, great mathematics. It had these great formulas you could talk about, nice mathematics. Uh, but that was, about, that was about it. It was an experimentalist who was along, along the lines of Planck. Maxwell Planck, who popped up and said, okay, let me just try this. He said, what do you mean, let's try this? Well, he experimented. And as he experimented with different materials, 
but I think a lot more safer than did uh, Marie Curie, who died of radiation poisoning. created the whole area of uh, New Mexico, Nevada, and uh, California. And at that point in time, <laughs> modern science, the predictable science, was dead. Because he did things that shouldn't be happening according to mathematics. But that everybody, everybody saw it. Well, it's just about 9 o'clock in the evening on the 31st of August, so about 21 hours into the day. And we're heading, heading off. I sort of remember what we're talking about on the way here. Now I've got to remember to think of how to continue the discussion. The atomic bomb, Gnosis, and the post bomb. See, what happens if you listen to a lot of the communists who will, will pull off of Karl Marx. Paul Karl Marx pulled off of Darwin and argued that since we are animals, that our best bet is simply to, well, behave as animals, that we have no other value than our physical existence, and that was fun fundamentally it. The problem with that is, again, it's not people would take the religious argument, but the argument is one of actual, one of actual phys physics. And this is what a large chunk of the physicists saw understood, is that without a god, and right now we leave the description of god out of it, because the question is, is there a God? And what happens is, without a prime mover, uh, to actually act as a force to move things around, then there is no organization. There is no movement in the universe, because this is the sort of prime directive of uh, Newton's uh, mechanics, the laws of motion. Is that things in motion tend to stay in motion, uh, until acted upon about, uh, uh, until acted on by an equal and an opposing force, right? And so what happens is that what, what is resistance, what is friction, well, friction is force act, acting in the opposite direction, so I think that will work to, uh, release or minimize the friction, and so we use things like, uh, wheels upon wheels, and what's the wheels upon wheels is, well, that's basically what a ball bearing is. A ball bearing is wheels on wheels. Uh, well, the friction that would ordinarily 
slow something down, let's say a brick sliding around along the floor, something flat, I guess a surface has a large surface area that it can uh, act that can act as friction, where a, a ball only has a single point. And so you can roll a ball where you can't really roll a flat stone. Put a flat stone on two balls. And now you've got a cart. Put a flat stone on four uh, balls, and now you've got a four-wheel cart and something that we call a car. It can be pulled by uh, anything. It can be pulled by anything, pushed by anything. In other words, its existence now is more mobile than it was before. Uh, this was understood even in ancient Egypt in terms of means of reducing friction. Uh, they had different ways of understanding and equalizing the force. But well, here's the problem with this. Unless there is a force acting to move an object or, or to change the direction of an object, nothing happens. So the question is, how did the universe come into existence if nothing acted on it? If nothing acts, and then any, everything that is random remains at random. In other words, the atheists have no explanation in terms of physics as to what was actually going to happen in terms of how things are going to move. They simply trusted the mathematics and say, well, mathematics is our highest truth and so on and so forth. And there you go. Right? And they say, oh, just look at the math. And amazing equations and stuff like that. And there everyone was, everyone was wowed by the math. Slight problem. As we said before about calculus. Calculus always gives you the approximation. It never gives you the reality. And, so, and this is the whole nature of calculus. The nature of calculus is a mathematics of approximation. There is no, uh, how should we say, actuality in calculus. It's all approximation. It is a mathematics of probability. So when you go back and say, well, well what happened then? What, what happened was uh, both Planck and then Enrico Fermi. Planck and Enrico, Enrico Fermi simply used the theory as guidelines as an approximation and then using that they develop methodologies to test out different variations of the theory without necessarily going going back to the theory they allow the experiment to dictate and the data from the experiment to dictate the next direction and as this was done Enrico Fermi on an experimental experimental level got the first fission reaction to go. That stuff was all moved secretly from where he was, I think it was Chicago, to uh, Los Alamos, and uh, that was covered the entire area of Nevada, New Mexico, and uh, California. These were all created to cover the uh, work on the atomic bomb that was not based on the work of Enrico Fermi. And, but the thing is, this wasn't revealed to the public until 1945, when you saw in the newspaper that the atomic bomb had gone off, something which was considered a mathematical impossibility. All of a sudden now, there you see it on the front page. And there goes your reality, because if your reality is based on the reality of mathematics, and now you're seeing something that shouldn't mathematically exist, but you're seeing it, this creates a, a, a called an existential crisis, where now your whole world is completely collapsed. And this is how things move from the modern world, from modernists, which is basically humanist view of things, that's Marx, and so on and so forth, Marx, H.G. Wells, and a number of others who are influential in the left and that movement. And brings it fully into postmodern. These are the surrealists. Yeah, there is a school of realists, of realism, and there's a school of surrealism. And this is the this is what we call the art. Art has all these different uh, sort of adjustments in them based on these concepts. 
and so all of a sudden now you have, have a world that, that, that's fully postmodern. It's not real. It's now conceptual. And this was confirmed by Stephen Hawking. Hawking's confirmed, confirmed this, again with a mathematical model, that the world is probably a hologram. So we now have a holographic universe. universe. With little or no sense, little or no sense of reality behind it. But this is what I was talking about before: how quantum mechanics shows the Holy Trinity and the nature of the Holy Trinity. In that you see things, observe things, but you don't understand that there, that there is no understanding. Even though they try to put the genie back in the bottle, try to create a deterministic universe, they were never, never able to succeed. The last major failure was the Higgs boson. They were determined that they would know, they would know exactly where the Higgs boson was. Except they never found it where it was. So the prediction of the prediction never occurred. So once again you're back in, in, into an unknown or probabilistic universe. And this causes huge problems for those who want to have a universe like 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 LeBron does, who based on intellectualism. Intellectualism is part of humanism, and humanism is based on the mathematics and science of truth. And when that's gone, so does it so does it.